Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the stream. What's up, this everyone? is uh, the U.S. Chess School with uh, GM elect Hans Neiman. We're very excited to welcome Hans to the uh, to the dojo. Uh, if you don't know about the U.S. Chess School, just hit uh, exclam USCS in the chat, and you can find out a little bit more uh, info. This is a program that's been going on for many, many years now and uh, is now being streamed for, for the first time uh, ever. Uh, this class is being sponsored by chess.com. Shout out to chess.com, uh, brand new up and coming Twitch stream. If you haven't checked them out yet, <laughs> twitch.tv slash chess. And we're very happy to have Hans, who's been, um, we were just talking, has attended multiple USCS sessions when he was uh, a youngster and is now giving back to the community and teaching uh, a class of his own. Um, yeah, let me uh, throw it to, to Hans, take it away. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I uh, recently reached out to Greg about, uh, you know, giving in or teaching at these camps since I, uh, uh, these camps are really important for me. You know, they're not only, um, you know, really instructive and I've learned so much in these camps. Um, the in-person ones are the ones that I, I really found the most value, but obviously due to the, you know, the current uh, situation, um, I think that it's really good that there's, you know, accessible um free high quality training provided by the u.s chess school and uh, that's always been really important to me and i think the social aspect is also really great you know the friends that i met at my first camp i most of them i'm still friends with today um so i think you can form really valuable friendships and uh meet, meet people who you're going to know throughout chess and um so I, i'm uh i look forward to giving this lecture it's nice to be on the, the opposing side since uh, I like to, you know, it's not, I, I've, sometimes, you know, I've been frustrated with certain teachers at the U.S. Chess School, but now I have the power. So I look forward to having the power over all of you guys as the teacher. And, um, you know, I also have the mute button, which is great, you know, <laughs> as a teacher. And my, my teachers at the U.S. Chess School wish they could mute me at our camps, as, as Greg definitely can, can, can vouch for. Um, so uh, the games I prepared today... Um, I prepared three games. Uh, third game is if, if we get time. But um, the first two games were actually from a recent tournament. Um, and uh, the first two games, uh, the first game that I'm going to show, or this is from one tournament. This is from this online tournament. You guys may know what this, these ICC events that they're holding. Um, ICC, they're running some all these events on like Continental Open. However, this is sponsored by chess.com and they're very thankful for that. Um, but they're, they're on ICC and there's this online events class with time control. And I showed one loss, um, which was extremely demoralizing for me. Even though after that loss, I was two out of three, I considered withdrawing from the tournament, um, which is something I never do. I, in my game, I literally just, my, I was, my opponent crushed me so badly, and I felt just a complete lack of understanding in the entire game that it really just hurts. And um, for me, it's been a struggle for a lot of my career as a chess player to get over bad losses and recover mentally. However, in this event, after losing that game, I went on to win four games in a row, winning first place in $2,100, um, beating two very strong gyms on my way to that. So that was a big mental thing for me. And the second game that we're gonna look at is my final round game. And again, the final round game, I, I might've won and won the event, but there was, uh, it was a very, very poorly played game. And I think it can show that even though I'm, I'm on my way to being a grandmaster, uh, I'm very, I'm a very beatable player, and there's a there's a lot of things that I still need to improve on. Um, so we're gonna start with this this first game. Um, uh, uh, I was black, so I'm gonna put it to the black perspective. And my opponent is Miguel Santos, um, who is a um, Spanish grandmaster, 2600 feet high. And um, we we were playing in the third round, and. He was, he was really strong. I wasn't too familiar with him as a player, um, but okay, the, the game started with e4. So I'm black and I play e4, e5, plays knight f3, knight c6, natural play. And now he plays the uh, the Roy Lopez. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this with both sides of the board. Um, however, in this position, obviously there's a choice. Um, the, the, the two moves are, you know, knight f6 and an a6. And in this position, um, uh, one, one thing that I kind of did was disappointed in myself here is, is I can not stress enough in the opening, especially when you're playing against really strong players like 2600 feet. Uh, your opponent's opening knowledge is going to increase significantly as you improve. And I kind of got, 
you know, I, I haven't really played that much against really strong players where I had been punished in the opening. And here I went for a subpar opening that I thought I could get away with. Um, and this is something I've been getting away with against like 20, 2,300 feet days, 200 feet days. But, you know, I really can not only stress it's just a general thing. You know, I think sometimes I feel like I should have maybe had some flexibility. Like I could have considered playing the Berlin, but at that time, a Berlin Nigel wasn't great. But okay, so I play a six, he plays bishop a four. And now obviously the main move is, is not f6. However, I play g6. And uh, this is a move that I played in where I got my last GM in Charlotte. And um, this move is, is not like bad or anything. However, against the 2600 feet opponent, you're going to get punished. And I didn't realize that. So number one, I didn't, I was a bit too confident here in my, in my opening repertoire and I got punished and I got, a, I got a very rude awakening um, that there were holes in my repertoire. So here, the main move that I had invested most of my, my studying into was, was C3, which is the most natural move, preparing D4. However, here he played like, like the third most popular move, which again, these are the, this is what top players find, you know? He, you know, this was a hole in my repertoire. Um, was this D4 was just, it was just a hole and it's actually just a great move and the computer really loves it. So obviously after E takes D4, Knight takes D4. Sorry. Um, um, he plays Knight takes D4, Bishop G7, takes, takes, and castles. Now, uh, number one, in this position, uh, another thing that I kind of learned a lot from this game was that when I saw this position, I was completely blind. I had no idea what was going, going on here. I didn't know what the correct move was here. Obviously, the, the, move, like the, the ideas here are pretty natural. But, like, again, this shows, like, in order for me to be able to compete with these really strong chess players, I need to, do, to develop my opening knowledge to where in this position, I know my next five moves. I know the three different variations in each deviation and all these different points. And these are the things... Like when you're really studying and trying to improve your openings, you guys look at your openings. Most of you probably think that your openings are fine. But yeah. when you really start to play these really strong players and you consistently play them and they surprise you, uh, you just you get this feeling of absolutely being powerless. And right. in this position, and he was playing very quickly, another thing that just completely intimidated me was just playing very quickly. He knew everything about the position and it was all just so fluid and he just crushed me. So, so here, it's, it's not that difficult to find what the natural move is here. Obviously, the knight doesn't want to go to f6 because, you know, e5. So the knight, knight e7 is the natural developing square. So then he plays rook e1. Again, he's still in his preparation, and I knew he was in preparation. And psychologically, that's, that's very difficult to deal with. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I can't really give the best advice um, to, to because the thing is, is that a lot of, this is where I think, you know, uh, my psychology could have been better. And something that I learned a lot from this game, something I learned from this game was that even if I'm playing a very strong opponent that is a bit intimidating, and if they're playing extremely quickly, and on top of playing extremely quickly, I'm out of, I'm not knowledgeable in a position where I feel like I should be knowledgeable. I should still, uh, like that's just all those signs and all those things building up. Like, okay, I need to like really take some time to figure it out. I didn't take the time and, and I got kind of punished. So um, here I, I played um, I played D6, which is which is a mistake. And it, it is a mistake fundamentally um, for, for positional reasons. So um, I, I don't know really, uh, there's a move here that can, that punishes this idea. Um, and obviously this is a bit premature. Um, I should have castled, but uh, if you're thinking in a positional sense, um, oh, sorry. Let me let me include. Well, okay. The move is not direct. Let me show it. Knight c3 castles. The, the move was was possibly to here, but the there is a move here that really clamps down on what White is trying to achieve. Um, so I'll open up the Zoom chat, and if you, you don't have to um, you don't have to open the chat. They can directly send you. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I yeah, don't see the Zoom the chat. Like, I have to pop out the Zoom chat, I think. Ah, uh, uh, sure. And a reminder to everyone, if you want to be called on, potentially, you put an exclamation up. point at the end of your answer. Um, okay. So, 
yeah, this is where kind of I got punished. Um, but you know, sure, you can kind of have the move, but uh, I'd like uh, you know to understand like what the continuation after this and, and how that's going to really affect the position. Um, okay. Um, I'll give it a, a minute, a little bit. I'm muted in Zoom, so I can just yeah, talk. I'll, I'll, I'll let in people from the waiting room to listen to people. people. But my first I'll instinct is maybe, maybe um, E5 is unpleasant for white. Okay, I'm only seeing a few people answering. Um, but uh, the move is pretty natural, but uh, I think. Uh, I don't. I think it might take some more time to, to um, yeah, to sure. understand why, like the positional reasoning. It's more of a pod structure thing. Yeah, give them a few minutes. If you yeah, think. give them a few minutes. Yeah, there's no. Yeah. Okay, guys. So, what do you think? White to play. Looking for a move to punish black. Maybe we'll flip the board here. My first instinct is like e5. Like if bishop takes e5, bishop g5 could be unpleasant. Like pinning the knight to the queen and putting pressure on e7. Black might have to go f6 there, but the bishop will be kind of caught on e5. And then if d, e, maybe we just go either bishop g5 or bishop e3 and or even knight e4 and just start playing against the uh, the structure. So e5 is kind of my first instinct here, but not sure. Bishop g5, yeah, also very natural. Very natural move. And then black has to figure out what to do with this pin. Either they want to go like h6 or, or f6. I would make arrows, but if I make arrows, then they'll show up on Hans's screen, and then they'll show up for the uh, the Zoom kids as well. So yeah, okay, running candidates right now are either Bishop G5 or E5. And Bishop G5 certainly sets up E5 as well, so Black would really need to react quickly there, maybe H6, H6, G5. Yeah, I'll flip the board so you can see it from White's perspective just for this move. Yeah, the problem with h4, I mean, maybe it's the move, but yeah, to me, it feels like white's pieces aren't really set up for, like, kingside play. I mean, our rook is on e1. And, yeah, I mean, if our rook was on h1, then h4, h5 would feel a lot more incisive. Though it does make sense, as long as the knight is not on f6, you can at least consider it. But maybe h4, black goes h5, right, and takes over the, uh, the g4 square, so not so easy. Another natural move actually is just to play like bishop b3, but I'm not sure this is really, uh, it doesn't seem like the, the solution, but it does kind of prevent black from playing f5, which is one of their main ideas, and it kind of improves the bishop. But yeah, it's so tempting to play for e5 here, especially e5, bishop takes e5, bishop g5 it really makes things annoying for black because we're hitting the knight on e7 and threatening f4. Queen f3 also possible move, but queen f3 maybe we have to watch out for f5. I think this is going to be black's next move if uh, if white doesn't doesn't prevent it. Yeah, so queen f3, f5, bishop b3 check, and then just king h8. King just kind of steps to the side, and and then white still has to figure out how to deal with f5. So, so really sharp position. Yeah, we'll give like uh, one more minute. And and then Greg's I'll saying almost sure it's bishop g5. Explain. Okay, who wants to explain? Type in the chat if you'd like to be unmuted and explain. If no one wants to, that's okay. Then I'll explain it. Everyone's Austin everyone's has an exclamation point. Let's unmute Austin. Costa, can you do that? Oh, sure. No, I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Okay, so um, if you notice that the black bishop on g7 is the strongest piece um, because it's situated on this long diagonal um, pointing at the b2 pawn, which black may also attack with b8. So my idea was to play bishop g5, uh, pin the knight. Okay, so he has to defend the pawn, probably bishop g7. Uh, and then we play queen to f3. And basically next move, we're going to play bishop f6 and trade off that bishop. Okay, interesting. Anyone else? Ryo wants to be unmuted. He's got exclamation point. Or Aryan. Not sure if. Okay, Aryan, we'll, we'll go with you. I'll unmute Aryan. I asked you to unmute. What's your explanation? Uh, 
Bishop G5 with the threat of E5. That's it? Yep. Okay. If you try to stop it with F6, then Bishop to B3. Okay, so that's a, that's a one move threat. Okay, interesting, interesting. Let's try and think more than one move threats. We, we're, not, we're not playing basic chess. We're playing positional advanced chess. Oh, Jason, Jason. Let's unmute Jason. Jason, can you explain why queen d2 instead of queen f3? Maybe, do you not have a mic or can't find your name? Hey, Jason. Okay, Jason, what is your, why do you want to play? Explain your idea. Yeah, queen d2 is um, just stopping h6, which black kind of wants to play. Um, otherwise, the bishop on g5 is just annoying. Like, there's no way to kick it out. Correct. So the, the correct idea is after bishop g5, bishop d7, uh, after queen f3, uh, uh -huh. the, queen, the queen is just better situated on d2. Um, preventing h6, and this pin is very, very annoying. I was way off. <laughs> so this is kind of the first subtle sign of, of things going wrong. And I, I kind of was just at a loss of, of an idea here. And I kind of panicked a bit. And um, I, I played the, wait, sorry. So in this position, wait, I played f6. Um, and and this is this was a bit of a panic. Um, I, there's no reason to to do this. This was, uh, it's not the worst move. It's not like a game ending move. But just from a positional standpoint, I'm blocking weaknesses. There should be three is an idea. Um, so I was a bit worried here. Um, but my opponent calmly responds to bishop b3. I develop queen d2, rook b8, bishop d3, queen d7. And now he plays rook to d1. Now, uh, I, I, this is kind of a, a psychological theory of mine, but I've noticed that in my games, a lot of my chess games, just in general, between pattern that I've noticed in my, you know, on, in my games and others, is that when you're kind of put into a corner and you're in a passive position, I often look to resolve the problem in a concrete manner. And in this position, I was kind of looking for a concrete way to liberate my pieces. Um, however, in searching for that, I, I made significant positional weaknesses um, that someone of my rating and strength should, should never do. This is something that a, 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 a 1200 mistake that they would make. And I could have, and this is something I'd never do, but I did, right? So, so you wonder why, what, what drives me to make such a mistake? Um, it, it's mainly impatience um, and just the, just the feeling, uh, I guess, a lack of, um, I guess, optimism, which is something that I have an issue as well. And in this position, I was just overly optimistic that everything would be fine. And I didn't realize how actually positionally dominant my opponent's position was. My my rooks are just terrible. His rooks are pretty decent. Um, his pawn structure, I, he blocks my d5 and f5 mainly. f5 and d5. d5 doesn't work for concrete reasons. f5 is just too, too weakening and has some concrete issues. I don't have any pressure on the b file. It's completely blockaded. So if I cannot play d5 and I can't do that, if I can't ever play e5, I mean f5 to open up my bishop, I'm literally gonna, just going to sit there and suffer forever. And maneuvering ideas like knight e2, knight d4 could happen, bishop h6 at any moment. Can you, do me, can you do me a quick favor just for the audience? Could you explain a little bit why d5 or f5 are bad? Oh, okay, sure, sure. Well, d5, I said concretely, like, y there's just too many pieces attacking you? Sure. Well, what, what's the problem with f5? Okay, yeah, sorry, I can do that. Uh, it, it's mainly a given, but, you know, for the audience, you know, we have we have the most talented uh, kids in U.S. chess, you know, they don't need that explained to them. But, no. But yeah, I, which, yeah, but okay, yeah, sure, I'll explain. So it can never F5. hurt, not a, you know. It can never hurt, yeah, no, no. Okay, well, well, number one, intuitively, you should, should, should be very drawn away from this move at five. Um, there are many ways to punish it. Um, just in a general thing, it's like, yeah, there's not really much of a follow-up. One of the strong moves against the Bishop G5. Um, 
And again, let's say like takes, takes. This pawn structure is actually very nice blockading it. Um, let's say takes, play knight takes. In this position, you're going to try to trade off the bishop. You also, there's just a lot of holes. Um, there's a concrete, I guess, way that to, to punish is if you take, take, and go for shoot g5. Um, mm, this looks very and now this is kind of an issue. Um, because, like, you, you want to take, there's a pen. If you move the queen out, then you take, take, and take with, with, this, with this discovery. Um, but I don't even, I didn't even feel the need to calculate it because intuitively mm -hmm. I just know that f5 is just not going to work. Um, and, even and just even say if bishop that's... d4, like even just simply bishop to d4, like I, I don't even, uh, the, the main thing is, is that uh, as, as a plan of chess, this, okay, this can be harder to say for some, but for most of you that are in the, or in the Zoom should, should intuitively understand that a move like f5, even like with no concrete reasoning, after bishop d4 and you're trading off the bishop and you've got all these weak squares, you just never should really open up the position without the proper, you know, backup, right? So uh, that's that's kind of where I just didn't feel the need to calculate it or spend a much a lot of time just, you know, going, trying to, you know, again, like I said, try to fix things concretely. So are, are you saying because the rook on e1 becomes open? Well, it's just the rook on e1 and, 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 mm -hmm. and there's just, it's there's no really, if you ever resolve the tension, you're just stuck. You're kind of stuck. There's no way to like improve because if, if you ever take, then you're just inviting. If you ever take, you're just bringing the queen in, taking, taking, and then the, the a, a6 pawn is, is really, is weak for the rest of the game. The pawn structure, the piece placement, everything is just terrible. Um, Feels bad, man. So, okay, moving on. I don't want to spend too much time here. So, well, I play g5. Oh, sorry, I play rookie 8, bishop d4, and I play g5. Mm -hmm. And 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 the move rookie 8 was was obviously to prepare f5 um, in hopes of f5, but okay, I play g5. Like, this move this move is something uh, a 1,200, a like, child, like, nine-year-old with, with no position or standing plays. Um, <laughs> like, uh, this was, like, one of the worst moves I've ever played. And, and the idea is obviously to play, you know, knight g6 and, and, and maneuver. But uh, this is just, okay, let's, uh, this is a very easy explanation. This is self, mainly self-explanatory for you guys watching, but in the audience, it would be tougher. Uh, anyone would like to unmute and explain why g5 is such a horrendous move? Yeah, and just just to note, like we have players of all level. I mean, no, but I, they're yeah, very no, strong. Like, but some of them are, sure, some of them are like eight or nine years old, and no, like, but even them should, would understand this. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure even an eight year old, fifteen hundred, can understand mm -hmm. why G five is a bad move, but but I can't. Um, or I couldn't during the game. So again, I, I, I when I chose to, to to pick a loss, I wanted to show you know me at my worst. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to understand who you are as a chess player when you're playing your absolute worst. Um, so, okay, who would like to unmute? Okay, Austin, well, you've already, you can you can unmute again. You had some some good, uh, decent explanation other than Queen F3. I don't know how to unmute you. Oh wait, where is he? Uh, oh, there you go. Right, um. Basically, this square, okay, it does give you the e5 square, but it just makes so many holes. I mean, h5, f5, h6. I'm mean, what's going to play knight e2, knight g3, knight h5, and uh, maybe rook e3, rook f3. I think you're probably going to lose the f6 pawn. Uh, in addition to that, what's going to play h4? And it doesn't seem like the king side is going to stay together. I mean, it's just falling apart. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so knight, knight here, knight here. Uh, knight to g3, just nice. simply maneuvering. And I play h4, just another absolutely horrendous move. Um, so the knight on oh, h4, h4, the idea behind this is obviously to protect the f5 square, but the knight can go, I just completely underestimate the idea of knight to h5, and now my opponent plays yet another calm move, and after queen c3, I stare at my position, and I realize that I literally don't have a move. I could not look at this position and find a move better than King F7. I can challenge you to find a move better than this. I looked and I looked and I looked, and this is this is the actual just best I have. There's literally nothing else I can do, and it's Bishop extremely H3 depressing. Pin, but maybe I can B3 never play C5 because the bishop takes C5 and there's a pin. I never play F5. I'm just going to lose this pawn. If the rook comes to F8, 
which should be 6, queen e6, queen c6. It's just all absolutely terrible. So you can tell by king f7, I'm getting pretty desperate. And I haven't, okay, oh, sorry, this is a good point. This is a good question. This is something I calculated during the game. So why does this not work? What is, uh, what is, what is black have here? I mean, white have here. This was something I was hopeful. But then I shut, then I got shut down because he has a nice way to, to liquidate things here. Takes an F3. Okay, that's, that's, that, that is a, a bit of an issue. I think we know why after takes an F3 is losing. Maybe I'm sure you guys do puzzle rush. 300 rid of puzzles. I'm sure you guys have done those. Oh, um, queen c4, queen yeah. f1. Yeah, oh, I, nice I'll point nice. it out. Takes, takes. Just check me at next move. F3, queen g2, 45 in survival. Well, oh, wait, nine of three my, my puzzle rush in five <laughs> minutes was 86. So you guys can't uh, you guys can't impress me with that. Um, yeah, nine of five. Just look, let's just trade every single piece off. Nine of five. Okay, I got it. I got one. I got it's one. very sad. If I take, nice. takes. There's just not enough left. Takes, just takes. There's nothing. Don't have enough power. If takes, this hangs. Takes, takes. Everything's protected. And if, oops. Oh, that's not good. Um, let me. So, in this position, not a five. Let's say I take, take, take here. Takes, takes. Rookie one, f3. It's not dead lost, but it's pretty bad. Bishop retreats to f2. My bishop's terrible. Well, okay, there's, sorry, there's bishop f6 here. Bishop takes f6. It's very, very bad. There's just no hope here. Down in exchange, king's wide open, game's over. Um, there's just nothing. I, I tried to make like an idea like c5 possible and in the hopes of maybe something like takes, takes here, queen e4, but even here, queen c4 just shuts everything down. There's just no way I can form any sort of uh, threatening counterplay with a bishop on g7 blocked in by this pawn structure. Um, so that was a bit sad. So I was forced to play king f7, which now walks into bishop a4. And after bishop a4, I'm like, I, I, I could feel the pain in this position. Um, this was one of the all-time worst positions I've gotten, and I'm already on move 20. Okay, it's not that bad. Maybe 20 moves is not. But in 20 moves, I committed so many sins, positional sins and atrocities to get myself in such a beautifully, absolutely soul-crushing position. This bishop and queen are amazing. To completely dominate the bishop. This pin is unstoppable. The knight's coming to h5, but at h4, looks a bit good, but it's just a, it's just a, sh a showpiece. Um, so I, I'm forced to play rook to b5. Takes, takes, and now F3. Again, uh, what really kind of hurt me and, and, and just made me feel even worse about this game was that at every single point, I'd watch, like, it, it, we on Zoom so you can see our opponent's face, and I'd watch him think, and this was this is probably what made me play even worse. Again, if you're playing in a Zoom tournament, do not look at your opponent's camera. It's just going to psych you out. I looked at his camera, and I'm watching him, and he sits there, and I'm looking at his eyes, and he stares at it for two minutes, and he just moves, and I just look at the position, and I'm like, oh, that's the best move. I should, I didn't mind to think of that. But every single time, I was surprised by all of his moves, and he's just, he was just so on another level of positional understanding that made me look so bad and made me feel terrible. And usually when this happens to me, my rest of the tournament is absolutely done. Like, I'll just spiral, I'll be mentally destroyed, I'm just going to lose much rating, Sometimes we recover, but it's pretty rare for me to recover um, and make a comeback. It's pretty normal that I just tilt, um, do it, you know, not, um, not the work. So I think that this is a big moment for me for like emotional control. And I think, I guess in chess, it depends, I don't know how much you guys really think of yourselves as emotional players, but I think uh, a lot of players, a lot of the best players in chess are, are ones that kind of have this raw passion and, um, I think that for me, that, that raw passion that I have for chess is really like a double-edged sword because that passion I have for chess makes me extremely invested in my games and extremely reliant and on my mood or happiness or whatever based on the result of the game. So if I lose a game and I'm unhappy about what I play, that could ruin my mood for a week. And 
that can be either an extremely motivating force that drives me to study and keep on improving, or it can be extremely demoralizing and, and cause me to quit chess for long periods of time like I have in the past. But I think a big breakthrough for this game was that um, in the past I've been able to, well, due to my, my main improvement and, and making you know ways to the gym title, a big thing has been managing this tilt and, and using my emotions and targeting them in the, in the right way to, to make sure that I stay on the right track and, and, and improve. Um, and I think there's certain moments where you need to let your emotions and chest take over. And I think emotions are good, but a lot of times in the game, you need to, to numb a lot of emotions. Um, uh, and I think a lot of that, I think I've been able to numb my confidence a lot because I, I'm, I'm sure you guys all have your personal things that you deal with in chess and that you struggle with. But for me, a big thing is overconfidence and I've been able to kind of numb that. And uh, I think overconfidence and optimism go hand in hand. And those are the two things that I think I've been able to work on. And this game really drove home that I need to work on those two things. And I think that caused a lot of, like a, it was kind of a wake up call for me. This game was a huge wake up call. And luckily I was able to, to fix things this is the game right after and uh, win the event. Uh, but okay, I can, I'll, I'll show the end of it. It's, it's not that, 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 that important. I'm basically just getting crushed. Uh, uh, I had one nice trick. I'll show you the trick I had. So he goes, he goes, you know, bishop to e5, which is a minor blunder. It gives some, some minimal chances. Uh, I'll let you guys try and find a resource that black has. It's still losing, but pretty, it's still pretty, pretty bad. But you can, you can start to have some hope. Looks like bishop g2, rook g2, knight takes. This was, this was a, a little mental F3, win. F3, king h1, knight takes e5. Haven't missed something for once in the entire game. Queen takes e5, rook f1, uh, check, takes d, e. and, and then we're still lost. Anything versus two rooks that's my guess bishop g2 rook g2 knight f3 king h1 knight e5 queen takes e5 rook f1 check takes d austin you're incorrect hey axel rose thanks for following big fan what else can we do right your, your your variation isn't long enough you need the full variation. This is if you've done some puzzle rush, you might again chess.com has a great uh, feature, puzzle rush, which you can get yeah. with a premium diamond or platinum membership. So uh, I'd recommend getting that as the stream is sponsored by chess.com. Beautiful. Ad champ. <laughs> okay, that is correct, Ryo. That is correct. That is correct. Okay, it looks like Andy has found it as well. Queen versus two rooks is yeah, yeah, yeah that is a nice variation. most certainly That's not a, a very, draw. very important variation to see Andy. Always depends okay, on let's the have position. Let's have Andy explain that that variation. I, I like that a lot. Okay, let me I'll request to unmute you. Okay, explain the variation, Andy. In most cases, two um, rooks. So I played this G two. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then, um. And I feel pretty much forced to take back with the rook. Mm -hmm. And then knight takes f3 check. Yep. And then king h1. Yep. Knight takes e5. Yep. Queen takes e5. Yeah, that's the key variation. Rook f1 check. Yeah. Yep. I move the pieces. I'll be nice. I'm not going to be mean. Yeah. And rook takes e1. Mm -hmm. And queen g4. Okay. Yes, now queen g4. Oh, you I pick up the rook is extremely important. You're actually you're actually just winning the game. Wow. You're gonna pick up all these pawns. So this was a nice resource that I believe he missed. Um, so I think I think it's easy to stop calculating after this position, 
Um, but just going to the extra mile and, and seeing Queen G4 is, is really important. Um, okay. So, okay, he missed that. I went Queen C8. He, now I just went Queen E3, Queen E2. And now uh, my position looks kind of nice with this knight, but this outside pawn is too strong. Next, he's just going to go Rick F1, contest the F file, and just checkmate me. So I went Queen A8, takes, takes, Queen A4. Trying to get some counterplay. I only did this because maybe if I could transport my queen to e7, then I could probably have some chances to hold. But I'm actually just getting checkmated, and there's nothing I can do. So queen a1, he checks, check, check, and, and queen e6. And, and there's just two mate threats of, of takes and queen h3 check. Now to knight g4, rook f3. Rook h3 is simply impossible to stop, and that's just checkmate. Check, just king goes up, and the, the checks just run out. Um, so this was this was an unfortunate, um, you know, thing a thing to happen, but you know my hopes I got my hopes a bit up after he he made this mistake missing knight takes e five, but it was still, you know, his one mistake couldn't make up for for my consistent blundering for 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 the entire game and playing just absolutely positionally ferocious, um, terrible hey, moves. Hey Hans, can I ask a quick question about that queen sure. takes e five position? What if white just goes rook f one and goes for the two rooks first queen position? Well, yeah, well, that would just be ideal, right? That, that's kind of something that you're, you're looking forward to. Um, you wouldn't mind that at all because the, the king's just too open. Oh, because you feel like black would have good chances here? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, this is something I, I was going to touch on later. But like, like let's say Rick here, the, the key thing is H6, you check, and there's, there's perpetual. Gotcha. And then um, I think it's probably still winning and very technically, but I think it's very difficult to win. Like, even after queen d4, this... Yeah, you're struggling to push this pawn. I, I think it's going to be very difficult to push this pawn and prevent, like, once this e4 pawn falls, if you can hold it. So, number one, in order to win this game, you have to hold the e4 pawn and push the a pawn, which that coordination is just not happening. Hmm. And if you lose the e4 pawn, you have to combat checks and push the a pawn. Pretty difficult to do. Um, gotcha. Especially giving the two on one. So, once these pawn advance, this, this king is going to get even weaker. Um, Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. I, I usually, I would have my notes on here, but I, they're all in chess space. Um, anyways, okay, so that, yeah, okay. So the end of the game is not that important. So, so let's go to the next game. So, okay, well, I'm gonna summarize kind of what I learned from this. Um, so I think this was a great wake up call for me in multiple ways. Number one, I can play some really, really bad chess under the wrong circumstances. And I know what those circumstances are now. And I know how to stop that chain reaction from happening. Number two, I need to do, I need to raise my opening repertoire to 26, 2700 two day level and to achieve the results I want to achieve. Um, number three, um, I, 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 if, I think it's fine for me to, to want to withdraw after, out of a tournament after losing a game like this, but I decided against it. But I feel like um, the way to fix this problem to being upset is just to never lose like this again. So that's my plan. My plan is just never lose a game again like this, at least. And I won't feel that feeling ever again. So that's that's how I solve it. <laughs> that's my way of doing things. Just my answer is just don't lose again. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so to the next game, this was in the same tournament. And it was in the last round and had the white pieces. Um, so... I guess I can also touch on the opening preparation aspect of this. Um, for those of you who know who have played, I, I know some of you, I recognize some of the names have played in, in the events. Um, the unfortunate thing about these events that the organizers don't do a great job of is that they put the pairings up right as the game starts, um, which is kind of uh, uh, not standard for classical like GM level play in these tournaments. Oh, yeah. At least expect just to get a, a five minute check on their opening tree with, 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 uh, with the color they're playing with. But um, in, this, in this game, I was leading with a, half, with a half point lead and I knew you know, who I was gonna play. So I was able to invest some time into opening preparation. Um, so uh, I don't wanna get too in depth into opening preparation. However, I did some pretty deep opening prep um, and uh, I'm, I guess I can go into some specifics. So I played the move in out of three here first. And um, so there was a few things I was expecting. I guess this isn't entirely under what I'm trying to teach, but um, 
uh, I think that a lot of you guys should definitely take your opening prep more seriously. Um, I don't know what, if you're around the 22, 2300 range, I think a lot of improvement can, can be achieved through really investing time into opening. So that's just some general advice. If you're looking for a side to, to invest more into your opening. For high rated players. I think guys. that's where the really small gaps happen. Like just the little, said the, the smallest plus. margin of, of advantage between the best players and just a small opening advantage can really decide how the, the game develops. Um, so we play C5, a move I had not expected. Um, I prepared for three different moves here and uh, very deeply. And well, I did it in about 45 minutes, so it wasn't insane, but I, I have some stuff that I've done outside of the, you know, not during the event that happened to, um, you know, coincide with the stuff that he, he, he generally played. And in this position, I was kind of an unfortunate, I had, I had to make an unfortunate decision. So first one, obviously I can play E4, which is the Sicilian. However, with a half point lead in the last one event, considering his play style and my analysis of his games, I wasn't comfortable with that. Especially my experience with the Sicilian recently has been great. Um, I could play C4, but that's a little bit too symmetrical and not really my type of thing. So I kind of had a psychological read on him. And if you, I think that these are, my opponents are um, Javo Kir Vakidov. He's a GM from Uzbekistan. His, um, it's like TJK Tiger is his, his, his username. You probably seen him online. He's, like, so he's a GM from Uzbekistan, pretty good. Uh, 2,100 feet eight, around that. And um, in the analysis from his games, no, that's not him. It's not Sindarov. It's, it's Vakidov. Um, Sindar, he's, yeah, Sindar was like the, the 13 year old GM or 14. Yeah, about that. So, so, uh, so, so I don't know if you guys, how you guys approach your analysis, but in my opening analysis, I, I found that he had an affinity to put his pawn on G6, bishop on G7. And like all of his games, he had this natural affinity to put his pieces there. Or he like, he just loved putting his bishop there. No, H4 is a bit too, uh, predictable. No, so yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit much. But I noticed he likes to play g6 against the Sicilian ideas. He likes to play g6 on move one against out of three. Against d4, he plays g6 sometimes. I looked at his, his chess.com profile. He loves to play g6. I looked at his brother's chess.com profile. He normally plays g6. So he seemed like a g6, you know, Grunfeld guy. His brother plays same openings. So based on my analysis of his brother and him, I decided that this guy just loves playing g6. So I played a move that I thought would, would fare well against g6, <laughs> b3, no, no. I played c3. And um, I mm. thought that if I could get this d4 structure, that would obviously fare well against this g6 structure, right? With the bishop being blocked by the d4 pawn on the diagonal. And as I predicted, he plays g6. So I'm obviously very happy that I've made a little bit of a read. I'm sure, you know, Greg can appreciate that from his poker days. But I made a read on his games, and I, I felt like this was... Again, I didn't, he has never played this before, but I, I predicted it. And he played, so okay, he played d4, and bishop g7. Now, I play the move um, e4, taking space in the center, pretty natural, it's the best move according to the computer. I was not a direct preparation, but the most natural way to play here is take stakes and now d5. And after e5, you've transposed to a line the Sicilian. Uh, does yeah. anyone know which line we've transposed to? This, be dragon, this, right? is a, this is this is a gimme. Alipin, correct. C3 Sicilian. Oh. And <laughs> I think and and for some reason I I, I, I played this line against them. So I, I watched Geary play this against me with White. And I just got crushed. So I was like, okay, this this gotta be good. I know this line very well, okay. I don't I, I think you don't, but that's that's the that's the mindset. You think you know this line? But then once you play a GM, you realize you don't know this line at all. Okay, so um, I'll be this position. There's a lot of deep theory here, but uh, according to the computer and according to just general consensus, white is an easy advantage. Um, you have space in the king side. The bishop on g7 is bad. There is some weaknesses on d4. The knight can go to c6, knight h6, and f5 can be threatening to d4. Bishop bishop g4. There's f6 to break it down, but just generally, you know, positional, sort of positional sense. The bishop's bad. It's very bad, um, and with a bad piece, you, know, you play around that bad piece, and you try to win the game. So he plays move a six, which um, is not a very popular move in the database. Um, 
And the idea is obviously to stop bishop to b5 because after knight c6, bishop to b5 is the main move. And there's some theory here, I'm not going to go into it, but uh, white just gets an advantage. Um, if he plays this black, I, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're playing me. I'd like you to play this against me if, you're, if we ever play. Um, and I'll gladly, gladly crush you because I've done a lot of work in this line after this guy. So don't well, play it against me, but don't play it against me. Anyways, plays a6. I just put bishop b2, not your developing move. Knight c6, h3. So, so in this position, I have a decision between uh, castles and h3. Um, and I, I think they're kind of the same, um, but I wish I could have spent more time. Um, this is kind of a yes or no question. Do you guys think castles and h3, the difference between them is, 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 is important? If so, if it's important, give me a scale on the one to 10 how important it is. Well, h3 stops bishop g4, so that seems important. Castles allows black to play no, bishop g4 if they want. To give, like, I don't know. I'm going to say it's important. Say yes, say I would play it. h3 here, stopping yes, bishop g4. This. There, yeah. should be, there, there are some, some necessary things. There's some important things to think about here. Again, I should have known the theory here. That's something that's on me for not knowing the theory and not knowing how to play this, but... You can't always know the theory in every line unless you're, you're Magnus or, or, or top 10 of the world. E6 is definitely unusual. My guess is that Black wanted to um, prevent White from, from playing Bishop B5. But yeah, it seems like playing H3 would be reasonably important. Otherwise, Black just goes like Bishop G4, takes, takes on F3, and then like Knight comes out to H6, F5, and just Black has a very easy time uh, attacking the uh, the uh, d4 pawn. Oh, let me fix the donation link. Thank you for that. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, there's a few reasons. So so in hindsight, it's it's very difficult to actually uh, understand the difference. Um, so the main difference after castles immediately is that this move f6 is is not that strong. Because opening up the center with the king ready castle is obviously not the great. However, if I play the move h3, this is the, the main key difference. This move f6 becomes quite significantly more powerful. Because obviously, you know, I, I'd much rather include the move castles if I'm going to try to, you know, take advantage of a king in the center than h3. Now, in this position, um, this is kind of a very key moment. Um, because you're presented with, with a decision. And Black is trying to break down the center, and you need to decide how you're going to deal with that. Um, so this is where I want people to take like five to like seven minutes just thinking about it. This is a really, really important moment. And I really want you guys to think about what you're going to do here um, and what plan. Because this is, this is probably the most crucial, one of the most crucial moments of the game. Um, is deciding how you're going to deal with the tension in the center. Mm. Interesting. It's a mix of calculation and evaluation, as always. Oh, F6 is play. My board's not updated. Sorry, guys. Okay, white to play after F6. Hmm. So black wants to take on e5, but it's unclear if, I mean, that seems like a risky pawn to take. So I wonder if white should think about just castling here, just allowing black to take like castles, take, take 95, take, take, and then playing for compensation there. EF6 doesn't seem to be super critical. Probably black goes EF6 there and knight G7. Although who knows? Maybe EF6 is possible. I'm honestly not sure. Tough decision. Yeah, My instinct think is to castle. Those are some more things we want to talk about at the end. Well, E6 certainly a move, but after bishop takes E6, it's not clear 
what the uh, compensation is. Black just develops and grabs a pawn. Knight c3 seems possible too. Yeah, bishop f4, definitely a move. So knight c3. Maybe black takes, takes goes e6 or something. Not really sure. Knight c3, I mean, certainly very. Anyone happy enough to, to unmute? No one, wow. He's got, he's got 37 of the brightest minds in chess. <laughs> and, 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 and no, no one's gonna, no one wants to unmute. Oh, well, 37 of the brightest young American minds in chess. Come on. I'm gonna call out some names. I'm gonna call out some names. I'm gonna call some people out. Who do I wanna call out? Let's see. I'm gonna put people on the spot. Make sure you guys are paying attention. Let's see. Who do I who do I who do I recognize? Um Alexander Wong. He was my partner. Okay. Alexander, what do you want to play here? Uh I think I would play Bishop F4. Okay, why do you want to play Bishop F4? Because okay, first of all, I don't want to take on F6 because then his knight will just get out with the free tempo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I don't want to develop his pieces. So I'll Bishop F4, let's say it was pawn pick, right? Mm -hmm. I guess knight take. Mm -hmm. uh, knight take. And then here, I mean, um, pawn take or bishop. Good, I guess yeah, pawn take. Is... Well, pawn so, takes. You, want, you, then, don't yeah. you don't want to trade this bishop. The bishop's bad, right? Stuck in here. Yeah. So I guess now it gets my. I will with but I guess maybe. Okay, uh, but the, the main thing to conclude is okay. The bishop's pretty close, right? D five yeah. is a bit loose. If you can keep, if you can maintain the e five pawn, then this bishop will be bad. Okay, that's that's enough. Okay, big shout out to, to Alex back back at the Chess Kid Championships. Me and Alex won clear first by a huge margin, crushing everyone. Nice. <laughs> He's an absolute beast. Okay, who else do I want to call out? Um, Eric Zhao. I played you. I remember you. I remember our game. Eric, I'm going to ask you to unmute and call you out. Uh oh. You <laughs> um, castles, because I like to blunder my pawn, because... Well, what's your idea after, after <laughs> they take, take this? What's your idea? Bishop f3. Okay, knight f6. Rook e1. Good. And now there's a few moves, but the main thing is, is you have bishop h6, there's knight c3, maybe bishop g5. You have full compensation for the pawn, and this is what I calculated. And after I calculated this, I wasn't worried about losing the pawn, even if even if I castle. Okay, good. Nice. Who else? I'm gonna pick yeah. out one more person. You guys are should be quaking at the thought of being called on. <laughs> uh, okay. Ooh, who do I? Liam Putnam. Okay, I know Liam. Liam, what are you what are you gonna play after F6? Well, I don't think F6 is stupid. I just think it's. I'm asking you to unmute. It might not be the most most accurate Hello. move for Black. Hello, Liam. His camera's off. He might he might not be there. Okay, he, he, I'll let him get away. Okay, we'll move on. I will, I'll, let, I'll let Liam get away. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I played castles. He plays takes. I take take. Now he plays e six. He actually a pretty good move. Um, and slowly but surely, I started to realize that after takes takes, if you look at this position. I was like, what the heck is my opponent doing? This guy must be an actual, he must be an idiot. Because look at this pawn structure. This, this like all the pawns are light squares. He's got all these holes, but somehow he actually gets away with it. Because my d4 pawn and my pawn structure is actually just terrible. Wow. My d4 pawn is extremely weak. 97 out of five is coming. And I don't have a good way to develop my pieces without losing the d4 pawn. If 92, they can take. I wasn't too comfortable sacking. This is just so solid. Um, so, okay, I put bishop b3, now I put bishop d3. Um, again, knight f5 I take, and this would be very good. Um, because let's say they take, then I go knight d2, let's say castles. I could even think of like an f4 move, but wow, you just notice here that these the, the dark squares are just way too weak. I could go knight f3, knight d5 possibly. Again, this is, 
I'm not going to take too much time explaining how weak and how many holes there are. You know, there's just so many holes. It's just five position. I play Dallas I play ninety two. I play Z five. I take take, and now I play another just absolutely idiotic move, showing no position understanding whatsoever. And I play the move Rook to B one, protecting this pawn. However, there is a move that is just so much better, and it's just very. It's a very natural move, and it doesn't take that much thought. So, what should Black White play here, and why? Maybe rook e1, trying to hit the knight on e7. What do you guys think? Bishop takes b2. Bishop c5 or something. Queen b3 I don't love because it kind of runs into rook b8, so that might be a problem. Queen c2 certainly makes sense. And this just shows, just you just need to display some like minimal position understanding and the move becomes very obvious. Knight b3 also possible? No, queen b3, okay. rook b8, rook is defended by bishop. Oh, no, actually, so this is important, so I'm going to give you guys a pun. Black can get away. Maybe knight b3. The two, the, the two moves I played here were the only two moves that threw away my advantage. Which is very depressing. Knight b3, take rook b1, bishop moves, and knight comes to c5. Maybe some positional, some positional compensation. It's easier to sacrifice Hans's pawns when <laughs> I'm not in charge of it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, rook e1 feels like my first instinct. Bishop takes b2, maybe bishop c5. Bishop h6, also a very logical move. But black will go on bishop h6, either rook f7 or rook e8, maybe rook f7. And then I guess we still need some follow-up in terms of the uh, the b2 pawn. What can we come up with here? Rook e1, bishop takes b2, bishop c5, bishop f6... And then, not quite sure what our next move is. Maybe knight f3 feels like we need to get the knight in. Well, Levy, I mean, if to me it feels like black is worse because of all the weaknesses. I mean, king's side has already been weakened, and black has this c pawn on an open file. White can just always go rook c1. So, to me it feels like black is certainly, they certainly have their share of weaknesses here. Yeah, dark square weaknesses. Um... Queen c2 feels extremely natural. Knight b3 again also possible. Just trying to get the knight into c5 very quickly. That's the only thing is that this knight on d2 isn't really doing anything yet for white. It'd be nice if knight c4 was a move, but it doesn't seem like it works. Takes, bishop takes, king g7, and black's queen is defended. Reeman says they're scared of knight f3 if you move your queen and rook takes f3. Well, then don't move your queen if you play knight f3. <laughs> you know, you can go knight f3 and then put the knight on g5, maybe put the knight on d4. b3, I was wondering, but I'm not sure if we're getting enough compensation after takes, queen takes a1. To me, that's very... It's some compensation for sure, but to me, it's un, unclear that we have enough there. Black will play rook f7 and defend the dark squares. So knight f3, maybe bishop takes b2, rook b1, bishop goes back to f6. And we'd play like knight d4 there, right? Or bishop d4. Can't you sack the rook here? It's definitely an idea, guys, like something like either b3 or b4. Bishop takes a1, queen takes a1. But is it enough? I mean, are we just YOLOing it up? Or are we actually getting getting some real play? Because black will play rook f7, Black will play bishop f5 and then kind of start trading off. But I don't know, maybe white has enough compensation there. That would be really interesting. Uh, does the rook e1 bishop takes b2 bishop c5 idea work? That's what I was trying to figure out. It looks uh, it looks like compensation for sure. This thing rook e1, bishop b2, bishop c5. Black goes bishop f6. From there, our next move is not so obvious to me. So it's hard to say. Hey, we're getting a raid from the St. Louis Chess Club. Yeah, I'll give a few more minutes. 
This is just a really, really important Shout moment. Out to and I spent like 20 minutes here and I got it wrong. So thank you for following, guys. Thank you for rating. We're doing the US Wait, uh, chess school Greg, lecture. How much time should we leave for the Q&A? Um, oh, let me get back. Hey, about 15, uh, 15 minutes would be good. Okay. Yeah, really critical decision here. Hey, thanks Freeman for the bits. Mickey Dead Guy says, well, you can't give away B2 pawn. Maybe you can. Maybe you can. I mean, pawns are just I mean, one. one so the best factor, is that right? Knight f3, wow. The reason why it's the best move is that you're not worried about this pawn. If you go here with b1, let's say bishop f6, you go bishop c5, you have a pawn, you have to rook to e1, the pawn structure is up a pawn, but these are terrible pawns, completely dominated. You got the okay. open b file, you got the open e, b, e and b file. The bishop can never move because of the b7, like, you know, entering. Queen can come to a4. The king's weak. There's a 95. It, it's just terrible. Just, <laughs> you have more than a compensation, and I completely failed to realize that there's just no compensation. There's just an, uh, an insane amount of compensation. So, Watch yeah, learn, that's, that's just... I, I didn't even... I, I considered out of three. Like, okay, take stakes. Push by six. And, and, and again, I looked at this position. I calculated this position, but I didn't spend enough time on it. Um, and, and that's where uh, that's where I was really, really mad at myself. Um for not spending like a few minutes on this position. And then I fully realize how bad it is because just the fish on C5 and everything, everything just, just comes together very, very well. Um, so I play Rick to B1, pretending to play next move. However, after that, that five, Bishop C5 is a natural move. Black has a move there that re that, that really that just saves everything, and it really really hurts to see this move. Um, so black has a really really annoying resource here um, that uh, changes the, the the course of the game. Hmm. And that I was I I I I I saw it before he played it, but I realized it a little bit too late. Okay, black to play, guys. Apparently black is a really nice move. So it's not just going to be like Rook F7, <laughs> Rook E8. Yeah, how, does, uh, how, does, how does black turn the tables here? It seems like it's going to be something sharp and dynamic. No Name says, I wanted to play Knight F3, but so can't but, see um, the continuation. I think this was more about evaluation, is just seeing that we have compensation there for takes and Rook B1. Murfinski says some Knight H4 ideas look spicy. Yeah, Knight H4 looks really spicy. Bishop takes f8 and like queen g5. Oh boy. Knight h4, bishop takes f8, queen g5, hitting g2. Very difficult for white to deal with that threat, yeah? If g3 were just taking. And if g4, maybe h5. Or even queen f4 possible there. Oh. Queen f4. <laughs> Isn't Ricky 8 simple and good? Well, Ricky 8 looks simple, but but maybe not the best move. I mean, no, black is definitely worse here if if they don't come up okay. with something. Because Ricky 8, knight f3 is coming. There's knight to h4. Nice. And nice. Obviously, well, most of you were probably didn't even consider this move because you're still just considering, you know, moving the rook. <laughs> However, if you move the rook anywhere and I go down f3. Um, this is very, very bad. Um, yeah, well, let's say you just go back to, 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 to G7. I could play basically any move. Let's say I just play Rick, Rick to B1. My next move is going to be B4. And after I go B4, I can go A4, A5. I'm going to lock this A6 weakness. My bishop is, very, is dominant on C5. This bishop has no mobility. I can go in A5. I can consider kicking the knight with G4 if it doesn't have... If the bishop has no targets. A6 is weak. There's, uh, it's not, it doesn't take a, a, a genius chess player to figure out why this is just terrible. However, after h4, uh, 
we've got some issues. So if we take Queen G5, it's just game over. Wow. Um, the G3 takes, and this bishop's going to move, and there's no way to stop it. It's going to be checkmate. If G4, Queen comes into F4, no way to stop this. So if you try to run, um, this check here, check there, takes. F3, knight takes. Again, this, 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 this pin and discovery is going to be pretty dangerous. So, I while while it's his move that I'm looking at, I'm like calculating. I see knight h4, and I'm, I immediately my heart drops. And I'm, okay, okay, I can defend it. I said rookie one. And the funny thing is, I actually still have an advantage. I still have a um, it's still about point four from it. Um, and queen g5 here isn't actually good. Um, I have the move um. Bishop to f1, and, and luckily I stabilize everything. And 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 Bishop h3, I have rook takes e5, takes takes. Fury gives a winning, technically winning advantage for white here, but you know for humans it's difficult considering the open king, possibly double. You know, can't double now, but just the idea. King's pretty open. Could be some tricks. Um, so that was a nice resource. Um, so he has to play Bishop to d6, but after takes takes, he's traded off. The, the dark square bishops, which which is good, um, which is which is good, and um, because now this knight um, this this action seven h four bishop actually work really well together, because there's so many different sacrifice sacrificial ideas with knight takes bishop takes, um, the queen can come in, there's a lot of sacrificial ideas and. This bishop on, on, on my, my dark square bishop was, was was good for protecting. So I played queen e2, which is a mistake. Uh, the correct move was, was rook to e3 and then queen e2. Um, so I could triple on the e file. The queen e2 first leaves my queen open to, to some attacks. After queen f6, I play f3. Again, another move that's some, somewhat of my rating. Uh, should, should never play. <laughs> Weakening all of these squares. Um, uh, opening up the f4 square, possibly the g3 square. Absolutely horrendous, disgusting move played by yours truly. And this really just shows that uh, mistakes happen. And these positional mistakes happen. And sometimes when you improve a lot of chess, you forget the, the basics to not play moves like f3. As Ben Feingold says, never play f3. Um, you know, yeah, okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make that joke. I'm sure as US chess school students, you guys have heard enough of Ben Feingold's jokes and probably got sick of them by now, as I got sick of them when I was at his camps. Yeah. But you learn to appreciate them. Okay. <laughs> F3. Um, queen G5. This is a bit of an issue. Bishop takes H3 as a threat. King H1. Bishop to 7 Queen F2. And at this point, um, as you guys know, I play quite a lot of online blitz and bullet chess. So uh, I'm pretty confident in my blitz and bullet skills, and especially in scrambles. At this point, I was down. It'd be 15, 20 minutes, and uh, I had a terrible position. So I kind of just like, okay, I'm playing pretty bad chess. Um, I'm getting outplayed. I have a pretty bad position. I'm just going to hold on, play quickly, and, and flag him and trick him in a scramble. <laughs> and that's what happened. But uh, <laughs> let's just say I had to do. I had to. I had to fight and outplay him by an insane amount to just to even get a chance to win. Uh, so plays rook f7. He simply doubles. Bishop f1 here. And now I had a chance to play, to play bishop takes a, a h3, I mean a6. But again, as a human, it's very difficult to take that pawn. So I play rook e3, another terrible move. Inviting out of five. Like why? Sorry. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Oops. Yeah, that, that's an unfortunate feature. Um, so so can you guys, I, can you guys, I'm curious. Can any of you tell me why this would be a good move? Welcoming the knight back into g3. There's just no rational justification whatsoever for the move. <laughs> um, I probably should have just closed my eyes and take to take in the pawn, but very difficult to do. I kind of just wanted to hold on, but yeah, rookie three again, one of my one of my amazing positional decisions. Um, you know, I had a five and I go back, right? So now I've just lost two tempos and I've invited this knight into g3. Good job, haunt again. This just shows that you know I need to do some, some studying and reviewing and. And you know, be more careful. So a5, rook c1 here, a3 takes, and again, knight takes. This is just a loss. This is just a losing move. And again, another point to show how bad I'm playing this game. Um, how does how does black just just 
get a winning position here. This 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 has quite a few few issues. Oh, knight g3. And, uh, very, takes very on f1. King takes f1. However, I want to ask Dallas if he makes up for it. takes. Um, that's all that my, that's, that's all that matters in life. Money doesn't matter how you play chess, how you win, how you lose. All that matters is money. That's a good life lesson to, to teach all of you kids out there. Is that money is all that matters. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, in this position, I play knight takes b3, and I allow uh, a move. Um, so, uh, and, and there's this quite a dangerous idea. Yeah, knight, knight g3, king here, and bishop takes h3. And you might ask, Hans, why is your fear oh, 2479 this... and you're missing such basic tactics? Well, whoever's asking this, when I'm playing chess and I'm, uh, I just didn't take the proper time and I wanted to just flag him. So I wasn't thinking properly. And when I don't take my time sometimes, I make really bad moves, as most people do. However, you know, the lucky, lucky guy that I am with absolutely no skill as a chess player, my opponent plays knight takes f1, king takes f1, bishop takes h3, absolutely throwing away all his advantage. Now, I'm starting to take down his time, and I can feel his nerves. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of an anecdote. I played his, um, his, I think, I don't know if it was him or his brother, but I adopted him, or his brother. I think it was him. In Blitz. So I was feeling confident in a, in, a, in a scramble against him because I adopted him. So I want to go for a scramble. Okay, we're running out of time, so I want to skip through. So queen e3, I offer a trade. Um, things things are complicated. I start pushing my pawn to get counterplay. Again, this is dangerous, but I consolidate. Queen d2, f4, and now he's he's getting low on time. It's a scramble. I've turned it into a blitz game. I'm going to dirty flag him like I do against everyone. Um, this is what I love about online chess. Just get to flag people. Um, that's what I'm best at, you know? Um, so Rick kicks f4, Rick kicks f4, Rick kicks f4. He plays this impulsive move. It doesn't win. It's actually equal here. And I play the move king g1, and this is the last question I'll ask you. Uh, how does, what's the only way for black to draw this? Draw. Um, I saw this game live. Wow. Didn't Hans also adopt Sir Khan? I did. I did, I did adopt him. I've adopted many strong chess players. Josiah Stearman, who just became an international master, I adopted. I've adopted GMs before as well. I adopted a 26-20 Fide. Evgeny Shambuliak is my son, okay? <laughs> so, you know, uh, I've adopted I've, I've quite a few strong Riddle. kids. Um, uh, you know, I take... Rick they, D4, they, I take Queen G3 check. And, um, okay. H2, maybe Queen takes Okay, H2. someone's asking to be Hikaru. That's not... I'm, I, I'm gonna have, is there is there a kick button, Costa? They're asking about my games against Hikaru. <laughs> Can I kick or or is that not allowed? Okay, don't answer that question. Sorry, don't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, anyways, okay. Um, don't bring up my losses or, or I won't call on you. Um, okay, so okay, <laughs> okay. So so none of you guys are saying to move. Um, I'm waiting for it. Rook f3. No. Okay. I want to do the case. So the move is, is, is here. And I, I'm actually just forced to take a perpetual here. Oh, wow. Perpetual is forced, unfortunately. Um, obviously, if you take this, check, check. And that pawn is not going to be stopped. Wow. So... However, Christmas came early, and in a $2,000 chess game, he played the move g3. Now, how does white win? Okay, you're linking clips to my channel now. Okay, I guess I guess some of you guys watch my stream. Okay. Um, what is, what is, uh, what is, what is white play here? Rook takes c6? No, that's losing. Okay. Looks really scary. I'm just gonna say it because I want you guys to. I want to answer some questions. Rook c3 is the issue, and Rick C3. you can't really go queen g6 to protect it or rook g4 because this is this pawn's gonna hang. So h2 check was played. King g2, rook f2 takes takes. Obviously not ideal. So I play king to h1. 
And the key move after rip to f4, rip to f2, coming in clutch is queen to g5 check. And when the king moves, you play rip takes. You've neutralized the attack, and you're going to be checkmating yourself very soon. So for g4, queen g2, he decides to take, and I take, check, and I had some nice checkmating. Uh, I, I checkmated pretty, pretty, I converted this. Hey, I'm, thanks I'm for the rain. Quite, Benjamin quite a lot. I can take the queen, but I ended up checkmating it. So I won the game. We all know that I'm a pretty, this was a pretty terrible display of my, my chess abilities. However, you know, I, I, I at, th at this point, when I normally have very good tournaments, I'm more like, oh my God, I'm such a good chess player. I won this. I'm so good. I'm so good. But this, uh, this, this was kind of different. Like I was just so appalled by my play that the only thing that could make me happy was the money that I won. Um, otherwise, you know, it would just be very sad and depressing, but I won money. So that's all that matters again, as I said. Um, so <laughs> yeah, the main thing from this game is that number one, theoretical knowledge, not on par. This is the same thing. Um, as the first game and something that I learned. The second thing was that my position understanding, as good as I think it is, I need to improve it a lot. Um, number three, I need, my time management was, was just bad. And I think a big thing that a lot of people can work on is that you may spend 40 minutes on a move, but you need to be spending 40 minutes in the right direction. Um, and I was actually low on time this game and I didn't spend any of my time actually evaluating the key moments which were as you mentioned this this initial after f6 and you know i guess something you can also learn is if you preparation that i mentioned earlier if you're preparing against the opponent and you notice a pattern or something they like to do or a weakness like i noticed my opponent's weakness was playing you know fianchetta and with bishop you can exploit that another thing is maybe if you think your opponent's bad at blitz or you can you know i kind of realized that I just had to hold on and that kind of motivated me even though it's a bad position I knew okay if I hold on for long enough and I'm not dead lost I have confidence to outplay him in, in a blitz or whatever format just because of my 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 dirty swindling skills okay so I'll, I'll take some questions now um uh I don't know how that works but I guess you can just unmute it yeah no thanks Hans first off uh great lecture very very interesting uh games and hopefully instructive to everyone to hear about how to deal with like tilt and managing your emotions. Yeah, basically the students can post some questions in the uh, in the group chat. Please don't well, spam. When will I get when will I get thirty two hundred? Well, I'm at about thirty one seventy bullet, um, but I'll, I'll make some progress. Maybe maybe I'll place tonight. Let's see who, see who's online. Oh wow, farming Kronke. Yeah, this guy really likes my stream. Okay, he is quite the the loyal uh, avid viewer. Okay, who's next? The uh, I think that I can provide some good questions. I mean, sorry, some good insight since you guys are you know young developing chess players, and I've been um, through a lot of things that you guys are probably dealing with, even though I'm still seventeen. Um, okay, you destroyed me. Plot. How did I win so fast in blitz? Well, I don't know. I'm just fast. It is what it is. Thrusty, instead of asking me questions, all my past um, opponents are just. <laughs> People are just about our games. They haven't been interested. <laughs> oh, I I played I played uh, I played Rachel Lee down a queen at the um, at this tournament. What are tips for doing balls? <laughs> Finally, a real question. <laughs> oh my god, a real question. Okay. Okay, so in Puzzle Rush, if you want to get better at Puzzle Rush, you've got to go into the Learning tab, and you have to find the rating which you're stuck at, and then memorize every single puzzle at the rating you're stuck at, and you can't, you're getting problems there. Um, so let's say you're getting, like, problems wrong at 2500, go to 2500 at Learning, and memorize all the puzzles, do it for 10 hours a day, and you'll get a higher score. How do you memorize them? Eat more blueberries. X D. Okay, uh, I actually do think blueberries are pretty good. Um, I don't know if they're mem help memorizing. I heard gum helps, like chewing gum when you're memorizing. Um. Um. Okay. Hans, well, I got a question. Um, when you said earlier, you you said you had to work on your opening repertoire. What does that entail? Is that just you in chess space looking at databases, engines? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just me in chess space. Yeah. Spending like, 
like over the past like month, I've been after well, after this loss, I've been spending like, like six hours in chess space every day. Oh wow! So that's something I've been very focused on improving. And how do you review the lines? Do you like these like training mode or go back oh, and no, forth? No, 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 no. I, I uh, this is I'm I'm lucky just to have very good memorization abilities. So I just look, I just see it and I remember it. Um, which I'm sure some I'm just lucky to have that. Um, but uh, you can just you know re repeat it. Um, but I just like look for you know new ideas and memorize stuff. I don't normally like try to memorize it. I just I, I just have a natural gift to just know it if I see it. Thankfully, fair enough. Um, I think I, I, that's not uncommon on chess players. Um, but yeah, I uh, use the online feature obviously. Compare engines, look for moves that um, like aren't common. You know, like moves lower down on the most played list are normally overlooked by most people. I also use chess.com for analyzing. They have a great feature, chess.com slash analysis. <laughs> um, and also to prepare for my opponent's games, I look at their chess.com profile, go to their games, click explore games, look at their opening tree, something I actually use to prepare for my opponent to win that $2,100. And I could not have done that without a chess.com diamond membership. Wow. <laughs> okay. That was, that was yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Let's see, guys. Yeah, we have a couple minutes for more questions. If there are any good questions in, in Twitch chat, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, see I've them chat as well. open. Yeah, I've chat open. Nice. As how much should the 1800 line tactics? The 1800 should maybe look at some more uh, positional stuff if that's uh, where you're lacking, especially if you're an online player. Um, <laughs> uh, waiting for for for. Is Hans ever playing bug out the 2013 US Open? Are you kidding me? I remember that exactly. <laughs> did, I, did I play with you? You know, you know, you know who I saw in the class? Julian Perleko. He might have left. But I remember playing with him in the 2013 US Open in Wisconsin. Um, no, not 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 Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it was my I was like three months into playing. Um, and uh, it was my first like big, big event. I was your partner against a wonder. Oh my, oh, that was you. Oh, dude, I remember that. I remember that. I remember at that at that event, um, a wonder's dad was like, Don't play bug outs, don't play bug outs because it hurts your chest, you know. So, I remember, nice. that. I remember that very well. Um, yeah, that was that was a fun time playing bug outs against them. Top openings that start developments, the London. <laughs> <laughs> the London, <laughs> just the London starts development like crazy. Oh no, who unmuted? Someone's playing it. I remember when you. Oh, oh, he didn't. He sent me a private message. <laughs> People are sending me private messages. Oh boy. Oh no. Okay. What do you think of the job of London? Well, that's a blitz opening. I would never play over the board. I think for Chuck to play. I prefer when I have my pawns on. C4, D4, E4, and F4, and their pawns are still on a C7, D7, E7, and F7. That's the structure I prefer most. Touch screen or mouse during rapid time control? Um, if you have problems moving too fast, then pull a touch screen. But uh, if you want to be a mouse, just gets to stay faster. But on the phone, the touchpad's not terrible. But guys, we should be answer, asking questions like, oh, Hans, like, what was your biggest plateau? Because no offense to a lot of young chess players, but most of you guys are going to get stuck, stop improving, and quit chess and focus on getting into Harvard. So maybe you guys should be curious how you're going to stop that from happening. How do you because, stop that from happening? How do well, you that's what, But I'm going to be honest, like, like, like 90, <laughs> that's going to happen to like 99% of all of you in this in, in the Zoom call. So, like, maybe you should be asking, like, oh, how, how do I stop that from happening, you know? Like, uh, uh, the thing about a lot of online players, you guys are all very young, and you may think you're, you're, you're all talented and cool, but there's, there's a hundred of hundred people just as good as you in the world, and, uh, you know, it's not, 2000 or whatever, seven years old, doesn't mean anything, you know? So, uh, you guys should, the big thing that I, can, that I can give to you guys is that, number one, if you're playing chess, and your parents are forcing you to do it because it's a good extracurricular, quit chess immediately, unless you're um, maybe the next world champion. Number two, 
Again, if you hate chess, uh, just stop playing it. Number three, uh, if you hate chess, please stop playing it because you're just going to end up hating chess and you're never going to improve. And, and, and a big thing that I see a pattern among a lot of you guys, like I can see your games and I don't know, I could look at all your US chess profiles. I'm sure a lot of you guys pretty talented at a young age and a lot of them, you guys are just stuck. Maybe you're stuck because you got some friends. Maybe you're stuck because um, your parents block chess.com. Maybe you're stuck because you dislike chess. But the reality for a lot of you is you're going to stop improving and you're going to feel very powerless. And the only thing that's going to get you past that is actually really loving chess. Um, I know if it's the Costia, but you know, Costia gets stuck at IM. It's unfortunate. It happens. It happens <laughs> to everyone, you know? It happens to everyone. It happens to everyone. But the thing that has gotten me through chess, through all of the plateaus, is that you actually have to love chess. So if you guys don't love chess, if you're not doing chess voluntarily, you're not going to get to where you want to be. Because when I, when I think about what I want to do with my life, and I think about do I want to go to college or do this, my decision is that I love chess. I love everything about chess. And I am perfectly fine sacrificing almost everything else in my life to spend 10 hours a day in chess, play, and do everything committed to chess. And that's what it takes to become the best and to not plateau and not get stuck. Um, also, uh, another thing with, with you guys is that if you're, you, you really can't get lazy, don't waste your time when you're young. If you are 10 years old and you're talented, you're 11 years old, you need to force yourself to spend 10 hours a day on chess. And like, if you're not in school and you don't have commitments, you, your most valuable time in studying is now because I have high school, I have other things that I can't always do. Okay, although I do spend all my time in class on chess base, I don't recommend, I do recommend that. Um, <laughs> I do recommend that, let me rephrase. Uh, even in this class, I'd, I'd be, I, I respect it. Um, so uh, the thing is, is that right now you have the most valuable time of your life. And if you're not spending every single hour, every single day on chess, you can't, you, you can't be happy. You can't be, you can't be, you know, like happy with just getting good enough to, to put that on, my, to get into Harvard, you know? And if you guys, you know, are unmotivated because you can't play, there's a turn, there's events on ICC, there's events on chess.com, there's events all over the place. Even just playing Blitz online to maintain the passion. Don't tell the parents, no, no, no. I want, for example, if you, if you guys are lazy, I'm going to have to talk to your parents and tell them to like take away whatever you, you care about. So they force you to play chess for 10 hours a day. However, then you might kind of hate chess and that's going against my advice. However, you need to find, you need to realize that chess is such a beautiful game and it's going to give you so much in life if you just really commit to it, you know? So that's my thing to all you nine-year-olds who are spamming random stuff in the chat and aren't even listening. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, most of you guys are not going to improve for the next three years. You're going to get stuck at 2200. Even, even, after that, even after that, you're going to start hating chess because your parents force you. And then you're just going to go to Harvard or whatever school, become a doctor. And you're like looking back in your life and like, wow, like I was so good at chess, but like I didn't take it seriously when I was nine or 10, you know? So that's my advice. I, I think that's good advice. I mean, yeah, all the kids in the class, you guys are so young and now's the time to just take advantage. Yeah, most of them are going to be nobodies in a few years, but Unfortunately, I want, guys, that's how it goes, I want yeah. you guys, well, it's the truth. None of, like you guys in the chess world, as soon as you start to get old, your relevance and people caring about you is decreasing rapidly. So you have to improve when you're young. You have to do it when you're young and you have to put in the hours when you're young and you have to have the maturity and the commitment at a very young age to really, really invest. Anyways, cool. That's well, that's um, we, we got to wrap it up here, Hans, but thanks so much for, for the class. This was, uh, this was really excellent. Uh, obviously if you guys want to follow, um, Hans on Twitch, I'll post the, the link in the chat and, uh, yeah. Are you playing any more tournaments, Hans? Anything coming up for yeah, you? Yeah, I'm playing this weekend, uh, at this, this online event, and then I'll be playing at this Texas state championship which is FIA rated um november 26th through 9th after that i'll be playing in the um online world youth event u18 i expect to see some of you in the lower sections uh, mm -hmm. i think i saw some names there's an under this is an online world youth um, i expect to see some of you guys there and you know bring home a, a medal for, for us and then i'm playing you know north american youth um hopefully we'll get the 2400 rating and become a gm officially okay actually let me answer one more question Hans, how come you raise so much on stream? Well, 
the reason I rage is that the uh, I'm very mentally and emotionally invested in chess. And I think it's a good thing to rage because that inner rage and that inner raw emotion is what drives me to become a better player. So without that, I'd be nothing. Um, so I think it's good. I, I don't I think people stigmatize being upset, but I think it's completely fine. If I wasn't streaming, I'd do, do worse things. Um, anyways, okay. Thank you guys for, for watching. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having me, uh, Kostya and Greg, for, for organizing it. Um, this, was, this was fun. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Hans. I'm going to end the meeting now. I will we'll catch you uh, guys later. Actually, Hans, are you going to be, are you continuing to stream? No, I'm not streaming right now, actually. I uh, ended before it started. I'm actually just going to go study some chess. So. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Take care, everyone. Uh, have a good one. Yeah, bye. All right, guys. Yeah, that was that was it. That was the class with Hans. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. If you missed it, um, the VOD will be available after the stream uh, is done. And also, we're going to put up the uh, the class on, on YouTube as well. Thanks again for uh, watching, everyone. Thanks so much to Chess.com again for uh, uh, sponsoring this class uh, and their support of the U.S. Chess School. Uh, once again, if you guys want to support the U.S. Chess School, you can visit their website. There's a donation link there. You can also apply to join. And yeah, let's um, let's raid someone. Actually, speaking of speaking of Ben Feingold, maybe we'll go raid go raid GM Benjamin Feingold. Uh, this was a lot of fun, guys. The next USCS class will be with uh, Super GM Sam Shanklin. That's coming up this Tuesday, I believe, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. That's going to be on this channel and going to be uh, really, really fun. So hope to hope to see you guys there. All right. Take care, folks. Have a good weekend.